This morning, we're going to be doing a little bit of a different format here in Parkersburg. We're going to be having a, a pastor's panel, and we're going to be talking about uh, signs of the times. There's going to be a segment this morning where we're going to have some Q&A, and you're going to see on your screen right now pop up a number that you can text. Don't call. Text any questions that you may have, and we'll be here live to answer as many of those as we can. Okay, so you're going to see this number at 740-994-0408. You text us our questions or your questions, and we'll do the best either live today or if there's too many, we'll answer them throughout this week, and we'll try to get you all the information that you need. Hallelujah. Well, I think that's all I have for you this morning. So we're going to go ahead and transition to our panel. We are going to welcome up our senior pastor, Pastor Dave Chisholm, and we have our, our worship pastor, Pastor Nicole. We have our, and she's also our pastor over our ladies group, the We Are group. We have uh, pastors Greg and Tanya Nangle. They're our youth pastors, and they're also very involved in counseling the different people here at The Rock. So let's welcome our panel this morning. Well, good morning, everyone. It's great to be with you online. We wish you were here because uh, I just like it when you're here better, and I know you like it when you're with me more. That's just how it works. But right now, this kind of reminds me of the days when we used to do a lot more television where we're talking to the camera. But really, I mean, the presence of God I know is with you right now. And even for the few of us that are here this morning, the presence of God was just so rich in worship. And we thank our uh, worship team members that, that are still going to come in and help us as we try to stay within the number recommendations to uh, provide you with some great live worship because there ain't nothing like worshiping our king, especially in days like today. And uh, these are interesting times we're in and we're navigating these hour by hour, day by day, just like you are. So many things going on and uh, I think this caught all of us by surprise, but guess who wasn't surprised? The Lord, Amen. because he's been, uh, he knows what's coming. He knows, he knows the future, just like we know the past, and God knows what's coming, and it's going to be all right. That's the good news. It's going to be all right. God is on his throne, but these are also exciting days we're living in. I mean, these are times where we see people really rise, I think, to new levels of love, commitment. I think everybody at on days like this, everybody kind of goes back and says, you know what, what's my life about? What's going on here? And I want to start this off this morning as we, we share together, and, and I want to get some comments from our other leaders, and we just picked a few leaders this morning, and our format may change up uh, service to service as we do this, just depending on how, how we sense the Lord leading us. But I want to start this off with a scripture about the end of times. And today, we're talking about signs of the times. And, uh, you know, I've been preaching now for 38 years. And I've been preaching for 38 years that Jesus is coming. And I've been preaching for 38 years that we're going to experience some difficult times on the earth. And uh, while I don't think Jesus is coming tomorrow, and I don't think this is the apocalypse, I do think this is a prequel. And I do think that the whole earth needs to get a wake-up call right now and realize things can happen just this quickly. And uh, I want to start off with uh, 2 Peter, guys, chapter 3, verse 1. Beloved, I now write to you the second epistle in both of which I stir up your pure minds by way of reminder that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by holy prophets and the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. Knowing this, first this, that scoffers will come in the last days walking according to their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they are from the beginning of creation. Well, guess what? Everything's not the same now. And I know for my lifetime, this is probably the greatest thing I've seen, as most of you have seen, most of you watching, we've not seen anything. I remember the morning 9 11 happened, and I remember 
I was taking my pastor, getting ready to leave to the airport, and we're sitting down here on Emerson Avenue, and all of a sudden, I go in the office just to pick up uh, something on the way to the Columbus airport, and the news came across that the, the trade towers had been hit, and the airplane had crashed, and uh, it was crazy. And from that moment on, none of us ever forgot that day. Well, none of us are ever going to forget this, this time. I mean, this is a lifetime event for us. And um, it's also a time, I think, to reflect and to realize how quickly things can change. The illness is real. People are dying. We understand that. We're not making uh, light of anything because this is a time where I said in a little video we did the other day, the church needs to be part of the answer, not part of the problem right now. And so we're doing everything we can to be part of the answer. And we want to do everything we can at this time to bring everybody a peace that passes understanding. Yeah, things aren't the same as they were two weeks ago. None of us are experiencing the same things we were two weeks ago. We wake up now in the morning saying, what are we going to do next? And we stand just like you do saying, how are we going to survive through this as far as our our daily lives, our families, our finances? Do we have loved ones who are going to be fighting this illness? And none of us know. But this is a good time to come together in faith, believing. And as I was sharing this past Wednesday night, for anyone fighting fear, I'd really encourage you to go on our YouTube channel and you can watch this last Wednesday night service. And I was talking about the believer's assurance policy. Psalm 103 and Psalm 91 tell us that God's got us. We're covered. We're covered under God's assurance policy, and he's going to take care of us, and we're going to make it through this. But at the same time, we need to realize, for a lot of time, people thought, oh, yeah, Jesus, Christianity, whatever. The world's going on just like it always has. And Peter told us this attitude would be in the earth, that nothing's going to change. Well, it changed. It changed quickly. It changed over the whole earth, and people are dying by the moment. So this is a time where we as believers gather together, in, and now we're doing it online, but we're doing it in the Spirit. And the beautiful thing is there is no distance in the Spirit. Uh, there's no distance. We're, we're all together as one. And when Jesus, Jesus could cast out a devil from across town, he'd say, the devil go, and if the devil was in another city, when, when the word came back, they said, at that same time you spoke, the devil left that child, or the child became better. So we can speak across the airwaves. We can speak and believe God that he's hearing us, hearing us every single moment. So Peter goes on to say, for this they willfully forgot, that by the word of God the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, by which... The world that then existed perished, being flooded with water, but the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord, one day is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, just as this illness has come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, the elements will melt with a fervent heat, both the earth and the works that are in them will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements with the, uh, will melt with a fervent heat. You know, this past year, they moved the doomsday clock up. If many of y'all remember that, they had it on the news. You know, the doomsday clock was moved up like 30 seconds. And so we're just seconds before midnight on the world's doomsday clock, not the church's. 
Because as the church, we know that there's an appointed time where there is going to be a sound, the last trumpet will sound. Those who are dead in Christ shall rise. Us that remain alive will be caught up together with them. We know these things are coming. We know that there are four horsemen of the apocalypse that are going to be loosed and there's going to be trumpets blown that will bring such calamity on the earth. It says men will pray to die and death won't come. These are the things that are coming. So, like I say, this is, I don't think this is it. I think that in a few months we'll probably be recovered and most people is going to be moving on with their lives. But let this be a great wake-up call that this is how quickly things can change. Literally. I mean, I've been reading about the end times since I was a boy. And I remember reading about, you know, the mark of the beast that's coming and the one world government that's coming. And then I remember back when uh, the first President Bush began to talk about one world government and the new world order. And we've got to see that the stars are aligning, folks. So this is a time where, yeah, we're going to deal with all this adversity just like everyone else is, but there ought to be an excitement in the heart of every believer that God's prophetic calendar is perfect. And yes, there will be a time coming when things are going to get really, really bad. But for us who believe, we need to be right now steadfast, as the scripture I read just said, be steadfast knowing this. This isn't a time to freak out. This is a time to faith in. This is a time to stir your hearts in the Lord and stir your hearts one with another. And so uh, these are a few of the scriptures I've been meditating on and I've also been looking into, you know, as we go into Luke chapter 21 or Matthew 24, these signs of the times, signs of the end times. And so I just want to kind of open this up to some, some discussion um, and ask some of our other leaders, you know, things they're hearing and seeing or what the Lord's saying to you guys. And uh, Greg, I'll just start with you. Um, I, I'm, I'm excited to have, first of all, leaders like you all. You know, every one of you, when this thing started a week or two ago, for us really in West Virginia, you guys were all just like, what do we need to do? There wasn't no freak out, panic. It was just like, hey, what do we need to do? How do we approach this? How do we deal with this? And I appreciate each of you. You know, J.D. and Nicole and the whole worship team, man, they're just like, what do we need to do, Pastor? We'll just get it done, you know. And, of course, Dennis and, and Greg and Tanya and so many other of our leaders that aren't on stage right now, but just as impressive their faith has been. Greg, what do you think? Things are changing. Things and, are changing. Uh, they, they've changed very quickly. People I've talked to, uh, the biggest surprise simply is that that this thing changed overnight. Really, uh, here in West Virginia, nationwide, um, without a single shot being fired. Uh, I think when most Christians think of end time um, things, they think of, they think of war, which is uh, prophesied to come. But our nation has come to a standstill, and uh, in a manner that I don't think anyone saw coming. Um, but uh, the body of Christ, I believe, is, is going to rally together uh, like never before. I believe this is an alarm for the body of Christ. Uh, the body of Christ, if, if they have read Revelation and no end time uh, prophecies, uh, this is definitely a time to uh, get in the Word of God, get in prayer, pull your families together, uh, rebuild the family altars in the homes of America. Amen. Yes, that's very good. And uh, to, to find out what the Lord is saying, to hear the voice of the prophets. Uh, to the unsaved, it's a very uh, frightening time, a very unsettling time, but I believe that the Lord will use this to, to draw the unsaved into the house of God. I believe their hearts and their ears are going to listen for maybe the first time in years. Um, as fear and panic ha have really struck our nation. Amen. Amen. Tanya, you want to chime in there? Um, I, I think that as a church, you know, your perspective is your reality. And I think we have an opportunity here um, to corporately decide what our perspective of this is. And I've watched a couple messages and listened to some of the prophets who are really speaking out about this. And a couple of things that really stood out to me was um, 
I think it was Chris Valentin said, this is a Malachi 4 moment. This is a time when the father's hearts are going to turn back to their children. And I think that there's an opportunity for that because when things start shaking and things start becoming uncertain, you turn back to family, you turn back yeah. to foundations, you turn yeah. back to things that have been solid for you throughout the years. And I think it's critical as a body of Christ that we represent that foundation. Um, I heard another prophet, a prophetess say that this was an uncomfortable revival. Mm. And I think that that is a really good way to put it because, I mean, even what we're doing here this morning has taken definitely all of us up here out of our comfort zone. But even as we walk through our daily life, we are taken out of our normal routine, out of our comfort zone. Um, but being out of our comfort zone means that we rely more on the Lord. And I think that that's critical that those around you see your strong relationship with the Lord because you can be the calm in the storm. Um, I also think as a body of Christ, man, if you're a tither and if you've been faithful to him, what an opportunity that is being set up right now for him to show his blessings on you and your family. Um, whether you realize it or not, God doesn't need a good stock market to bless you. God doesn't need a good economy to bless you. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to take it a step further. For those of you that are without a job right now because of this virus, God doesn't need your job to bless you. Come so on. don't limit God in these yeah. times. Because if there's ever a time for his outpouring to show, man, the stage is set right now. And because as you are blessed, he will be glorified. And so don't limit God. Don't let your faith in him being a good father be shaken because he only has good things for you, regardless of what's going on in the world. He only has good things for you. Excellent. Excellent. You know, I was um, talking with my pastor on the phone yesterday, and um, as we were talking about what's going on, I'd made the comment to him. I said, you know, pastor, I said, uh, my biggest concern right now is for the families and for the churches. And uh, churches are just like everyone else. I mean, they've got things going on. They've got bills to pay. They have families that are dependent on them. And as I was kind of sharing that concern, my pastor said, uh, he said, now, Dave, the ravens are coming, son. The ravens are coming. He said, God brought food by ravens and by a widow to a prophet and he said God is going to sustain the churches no matter what and I thought amen and I'm telling you a peace just came over me the, the man is said the that. man is going to come every morning amen the man is the going man to come every will morning. be there God has never been bound to a system of the earth he operates outside the system to take care of his people and I just started declaring right then Nicole we're in the land of Goshen we are not in Egypt. We're in the land of Goshen. Amen. What's God talking to you about right now? Well, back in September, the Lord began to put on my heart Psalm 91. I have been in Psalm 91, and anybody who's been in worship with me has probably heard me begin to sing out, I'm going to dwell in the secret place, I'm going to dwell in the secret place. Well, now I know why he had me there. Amen. <laughs> um, but that has been on my heart. I preached a message on it in October, and, um, you know, Honestly, we have to know as the body of Christ um, that this is the time where we begin to dig in and really pursue his presence like never before. Um, I believe that worship and praise is the, the greatest tools and weapons that we have as the body of Christ. And I believe that when we begin to, to worship and praise the Lord and speak out the praises of God throughout the earth, when we speak the name of Jesus in the atmosphere, things shift and change. I believe Amen. that. And um, so when, when we dwell in his presence, when we dwell in the secret place of the most high pastor, just like you preached, there's a safety that comes. And yeah. to get into the shadow of the almighty, you got to get near. Yeah. <laughs> you got to get near. You can't stand afar off. You'll have to get near. The shadow is casted near where the, the father is. So we've got to get near. 
You've got to hang out in the shadow of the Most High God. And when people are afraid, you can say, oh, I'm not afraid. I'm in the shadow. I'm in the shadow. My God will protect me me. Now that doesn't mean bad things don't happen to godly people because they do. But what we have to know is no matter what is happening in the earth, we have a hope. We have a hope in knowing that Jesus paid it all. We have a future, no matter what that future may be. It may not always be what we think it should be, Mm -hmm. but he has a perfect future for his children. So, so the Lord is just having me dig in more and more of, of, you know, worship and praise. That's where my heart is. But as the body of Christ, we were created to worship and praise the Lord. And I believe that, and I heard Rick Pino, I read a comment from Rick Pino and he said, this is the, it's the greatest time ever to when you can praise and worship God when things aren't going well, because in eternity, in eternity, Things are always perfect. This is the only time that we have to worship God when things right. aren't going so well. Right. It's now in our lifetime. And this is a beautiful offering that we, that we offer up to God and saying, I may be afraid, but I'm going to lift my hands anyway. Amen. I, I'm, I may feel dismayed in my heart, but I'm not going to go by my feelings. I'm going to step past that and lift up my hands and praise the God who I know will sustain me. And, and, you know, my heart is where I guess it's always been, no matter what comes my my way. I'm going to praise the Lord because that's where my shelter is. That's where my help comes from. Amen. Amen. Well, I think that'll preach right there. <laughs> Hallelujah. I'm ready to take an offering right now. Come on, somebody. I'm going to, I'm going to uh, mail Nicole an offering after that. <laughs> praise God. That's good. Dennis, what are you hearing in your spirit? Well, you know me, pastor. I'm going to start off with some numbers on you. Um, and I want to say this, these numbers should scare the fire out of the body of Christ. According to Pew Research, I just read this the other day, only 63% of U.S. adults absolutely, I mean absolutely believe in God. And from this, only 18% under the age of 30. Wow. You know, when say, we that, take, say that again. Say yeah, that again. Absolutely. 63% of U.S. adults absolutely believe in God. Translation, that means that only 63% of the people say, I know there's a God. I know and believe in God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. But from that, only 18% of them under the age of 30. Wow. So, Pastor Dave, here's one of the biggest challenges that I have. You know, most of my time in, in the church is spent, you know, either counseling or doing administrative things. But when I take a look at these numbers and I talk to people day in and day out, I realize that we are in a crisis mm-hmm. because we take for granted the fact that there, there's a difference between idealism and realism. Right. We've been in a place of idealism for so long. We can come to a nice church with padded seats. We can hear a great message. We have the opportunity to, you know, to get a nice drink out at the cafe and we can listen anytime we want, whenever we want, how much we want. But at what point does the gospel of Jesus Christ, does the power of the Holy Spirit become real? Because these are some other statistics that just blew me away. And I know that Pastor Dave and Ta- or Pastor Greg and, and Tanya working with youth have probably known this for years. But, you know, the CDC came out with a stat saying that there was uh, over 800,000 legal abortions in 2018. Yeah. And in the past decade, Pastor Dave, youth suicides have gone up 56%. Well, you know, the next generation is looking at us. Mm -hmm. They're looking at us to say, is your faith real or is it ideal? Mm -hmm. And our young people need to see people stand up and say, you know what? I'm not about compromise anymore. I don't want to just have people say, you know, it's, it's nice that you go to church. People need to see the church coming together and expressing themselves in all of their inadequacies, in all their dysfunctions, saying, you know what? I don't have an excuse anymore not to trust. You know, I'll never forget, I think it was you that said one time, Pastor Dave, there is no functional family. There's just different levels of dysfunction. Correct. But we've got to pursue God. Yeah. So I guess the last thing I just want to encourage the church to do is during these times, you've got to lower your expectation for everything to be perfect and to allow yourself to trust again. Because we need to connect to a head, to a body, to a pastor, to people. 
as they submit to God and hear from God, to be able to be a part of a family where we can change, where we can be led by the things of God, and that we can pursue the things of God, where our next generation, they don't have a prayer. Amen. Yeah. You know, I, I've read in the statistics right now are that there are about 2,700 abortions per day. About 1,000 abortions a day are being facilitated by just Planned Parenthood in America. That's last year it was right around 360,000 abortions. And someone said to me the other day, you know, we're having this great outcry about the people dying of the virus in the church. Where's the outcry for the unborn that are being literally slaughtered every day? And so I think it is a time where this ought to jar every one of us in the fact of, yeah, death is all around us, and many times it's being covered up. Yeah. Death is being covered up. Death is not out in front of us, you know. We put our, our, our funerals kind of over to the side and through hospitals and all the technology for, for medicine. Everything's kind of put aside. But now it's right in our face. Death is real. I want to be ready to die. And I want everyone listening to this to be ready to die. I want to be ready to meet Jesus. You know, I, I turned 61 this week, and uh, it's amazing to me that I recognize and realize death is real. It's coming. It's coming for all of us. You know, I've heard over and over, this virus is, is a lot more deadly to those who are a little older or those with underlying conditions, you know. And, and I recognize that at 61, I don't have the same level of possibly having this as someone who's 20. But at the same time, now we're, we're hearing this thing's hitting everybody. It's hitting even young people. I was watching some interviews, and uh, one lady was 58, and she was saying, don't be, uh, don't be too lax in this because she had the, the virus last week. She said on the news this morning, she said, this thing was brutal. It was brutal at 58 with no underlying conditions. So, again, it's not a time to be in fear. It's a time to be in faith. But it's also a time to know exactly where you're going if you die, when you die. Because whether it's a virus or anything else, this thing has just brought death right back to the forefront for all of us. And it's, it's actually, I think, causing everyone to take some inventory in their spiritual lives. You know, again, back to this verse in Peter. It says uh, in verse 13, Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Beloved, therefore, looking forward to these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace without spot and blameless. And consider the long suffering of our Lord as salvation and also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, has written to you. And so we recognize that this is a time where as believers we grab hold of peace. But this is also a great time to call the whole world to an account of saying, where is your heart? Where is your heart with God right now? Death is in your face. Death is not buried on an obituary page in the newspaper or tucked away in a hospital room somewhere or hidden back in a funeral uh, parlor. This is in our face we're seeing it all day long. So many dead, so many dead, so many infected, so many dead. Uh, you know, the numbers are doubling and doubling and doubling. You know, it was easy to see. I know with our governor and the other governors, they're literally almost in a panic mode of trying to figure out how can we save our people and what do we need to do and how, how we need to all be responsible and, and, and taking our part in this. But... Let's go a step further. Where's your heart? Where's your heart? Do you know Jesus? Because I'm telling you right now, death is right here with us. Death is out in public right now. Death's not hiding away in private right now. Death is out in public. And so I'm not afraid to die right now. I don't want to die right now because I think I still got work to do as everybody here does. But I have that peace that I just read about. You know, the Bible calls it a peace that passes understanding, and every single person can have that peace. And I know the majority of the people logged in right now, 
you probably are at peace and you probably are born again. You probably know Jesus as your Savior. But you're going to be interacting with others every day who don't. And, you know, we as a church have a great responsibility. I had this sent to me a couple of times in the last few days. And I want to just read it because I think it's brilliant. Um, the, uh, the great theologian Martin Luther um, in 19, or I'm sorry, in 1527, a deadly plague had hit his town of Wittenberg. And he wrote a friend to a letter about the plague that had just hit his town. Now, this is Martin Luther, you know, the father, the reformer, the man who had so much of an impact on our church history. And this is what he answered when asked, what should we do as believers? And this is how Martin Luther answered. I shall ask God mercifully to protect us. Then I shall fumigate, help purify the air, administer medicine, and take it. I shall avoid places and persons where my presence is not needed in order to become contaminated and thus perchance inflict and pollute others and so cause their death as a result of my negligence. If God should wish to take me, he will surely find me and I have done what he has expected of me and so I am not responsible for either my own death or the death of others. If my neighbor needs me, however, I shall not avoid place or person, but shall go freely as stated above. See this as such a God-fearing faith, because it is neither brash nor foolhardy, nor does it tempt God. And that's a great, a great way to put, I think, what all of us are going through now. You know, we're here this morning as just a skeleton crew because we think this is an essential gathering. This is a time where we want to secure you and your faith. And this is a time where we want to limit fears and limit what's going on around us. But at the same time, we want to walk with wisdom and we want to be a part of the answer again and not the problem. And so I'm just encouraging every one of you as we have these, these I like, you know, they call them watch parties or as we're streaming online, to join with us and pray together and stand together and believe together. As things begin to change over the next several weeks, we will adapt and do everything we can to be a blessing and to help others. You know, we're having some questions come in, and uh, we're trying our best to answer those as we know the answer to them. Because, like I say, this caught us all off guard. But God's on the throne, and, and we know that he's got all the answers, and we're excited about that. Amen. Dennis, we got any questions that you, you would want to yes, field sir. right now? We do. We have some good questions. I want to thank everybody for responding. You guys are, are on it. Uh, Pastor, first question is, let me click on that again. This comes from uh, North Parkersburg. Is the mark of the beast after the rapture, that's part one, and part two, will, will Christians be around to see or experience the mark of the beast? That's a great question. And if I had the answer to that, <laughs> I could probably sell it and make a million. <laughs> I think, you know, here, here's the thing about the end times. And this, you know, I've, I've been a student of eschatology or end times all my life. Even before I was saved. When I was just a kid, my mom had a, a, a missionary, a guy from Beirut, Lebanon, that used to come to her church. And I was just a little boy back in the, you know, the 60s when... The, what we call rapture fever began to come onto the church. And everybody thought Jesus was coming very quickly, including myself. And uh, I remember uh, through those days, my mom would seed my bedroom with books about the end times. Well, I don't even know if she knew it, but I read every one of them. And there was an author back then, he's still around today, but back then he was, he was a household name, and that was Hal Lindsey. And he wrote a book, and it became a movie called The Late Great Planet Earth. 
about the end time prophecies coming to pass. And that movie had the greatest impact on the earth that time, about like the passion of the Christ did here, you know, 15 years ago. It, was, it wrecked the whole world, so to speak, and it caused great revival. And there were great revivals happening at that time around the question of the end times, the rapture of the church. There were movies made. There were all kinds of things happening. Well, I've been a student of that my whole life. And uh, I've, I've changed some views on things, but primarily I would say this about the end times. Number one, the scripture is clear that the wrath of God is reserved for wicked people, not righteous people. God doesn't pour out his wrath on his children. He pours out his wrath on those who will and are rejecting him. And so as a believer, how much will we experience of this end time? Well, I don't want to experience what I'm experiencing this week. You know, I would not even mind the rapture happening about a month ago. You know, I don't want to have to deal with this any more than you do. But at the same time, we recognize believers have been going through hardships since Christ walked the earth and before. Look at what Israel has endured over the last 6,000 years. Look at the, you know, it would be hard for us to say, God will never allow anything bad to happen to us. And then look at what has happened to so many people. A lot of people don't realize this. There have been more, you know, we read about the martyrs, Fox's Book of Martyrs and Eusebius Book of Ecclesiastical History. And when we see the, the catacombs of Rome and we see the history of hundreds of thousands and into the millions of believers that have been slaughtered because of their faith, a lot of people don't realize there have been more Christian martyrs in the last 100 years than in the last 2,000 years. And believers are dying for their faith every day. So I'm not going to take the side of saying nothing bad is going to happen to us because we're going to be raptured out as the church. I'm not going to take that side, but I'm also not going to take the side of we're going to go through the seven years of trial and tribulation that God's going to pour out on the whole earth, and we're going to get stung by the locusts that have the power to sting and to persecute men in their tails, and we're not going to see the blood up to the horses' bridles and, and the horrible trumpet judgments where men will cry out for the rocks to fall on them so they'll die, but death will flee from them. And so I'm not going to go to that extreme for the church either. But I do know this. We will be going through some stuff. The mark of the beast has, you know, there have been different ideas about what the mark of the beast would be, again, since I was a kid. When I was a kid, the early uh, mark of the beast that people thought it would be was the ISBN mark. That barcode that's on everything you buy, when that barcode first came out, everybody thought, that's the mark. And even some of the movies were produced showed that, that barcode on the back of people's hands. But I think that uh, the mark of the beast is definitely going to be around technology. We know that through the microchip, the Mondex chip, that right now can be put in the back of your hand or your forehead. It can be implanted under your skin. It's a microcomputer, a microprocessor. It's a GPS. It will fulfill all the requirements of the mark of the beast. In fact, the very word mark in the Greek means to prick with a needle. That's what that word mark means, to prick with a sharp needle. So we know that that chip is injected through that. Now, will everyone who has a microchip have you taken the mark of the beast? Again, I don't think that's the case because it says to all who receive the mark and worship his name, the name of the beast. There's more to it than just a chip in your body. There's more to it than that. There is coming a time where our government is not going to demand us not to just assemble, but our government is going to demand us to stop worshiping our God. And when that begins to happen, you know things are going down quick. Now, will we be here for that? I don't know. I can't tell you that. I personally, in my own faith, believe in a rapture of the church, and I see it. And again, this is my opinion, and there are so many opinions about prophecy. But when I look in the Revelation chapter 7, 
I see a place, and I saw this probably 30 years ago, and to me, it makes sense. It fits the scenario. And that is that there's a great multitude that all of a sudden appears in heaven. And the scripture says, they're beyond number. They're from every tribe, every tongue, every nation. A multitude that no one can number suddenly appears in heaven. Now, to me, I see that as probably the rapture of the church because that is the best explanation I can find. But again, I don't think we're there yet. There are still a lot of prophecies that have to be fulfilled. People are still getting born again every day. You know, the Lord is, as we read, long-suffering, waiting for his harvest. And so I know there'll be some, some crazy things happening, and we may be a part of what we would call some pretty serious tribulation in the earth, but not the wrath of God. That is reserved for the wicked. And when God starts doing that stuff, that's when people, again, will cry out. But at that point, there won't be any salvation at, at, from the things that are coming on the earth at that time. So we want to keep our hearts ready and prepared. We don't know when it is. The scripture says we don't know the day of his coming. Anybody else want to chime in on that? <laughs> okay. I don't want to go through... I, as nobody else wants to go through the tribulation. I just heard this morning that <clears throat> when, when God brought judgment on Sodom and Gomorrah, he, in a sense, acted as a rapture by pulling yeah. Lot and his family out before judgment came. Yes. He pulled out the righteous, and then judgment came. And I believe that that is a precursor yeah. to a rapture prior Definitely. to the tribe. Prior to the tribulation. And really, when you look at history, and I've, I've, I've read this before in days past, that usually before judgment hits a nation or a place, there's a prophetic warning. Just a, a, a pretty modern one would be Armenia. And if you've ever studied what happened in Armenia before uh, the invasion came from the Soviets and they, all the people were wiped out, they had prophetic words to the church and millions fled Armenia and were spared from that slaughter because the church warned them. And God does have a way of before he pours out his wrath, he removes the righteous. Just like he built the ark for Noah and his family, he brought... Um, lot out of out of Sodom and Gomorrah and his he will protect us and bring us out for sure that's good what else you got there Dennis I have another question this is actually directed towards uh, our worship leaders JD and Nicole and this question is this um, during these difficult times I want to press in and worship and I know that's what I'm supposed to do but emotionally I don't feel it so I'm wondering, is there something wrong with me if I don't feel God, but I want to worship God? There's absolutely nothing wrong with you. Um, many times uh, we worship God because of who he is, not because, well, all the time. We worship God because of who he is, not because of how we feel. And um, when we're going through a, a trial or, or confusion or fear, there are times that we're absolutely worshiping and praising God in, in straight up faith. <laughs> there are times when you see us up here or any worship leader, they're going through trials and things, but they are standing in faith. There are times that you have to remind yourself, I believe what I'm singing. I believe what I'm confessing. Mm -hmm. I, I, I remind myself, that's why David said, Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. I will bless his holy name. Because there are times we just don't feel like it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We just don't feel like it. Because we may be hurting. We may be going through something that is painful or tragic or um, horrible that no one could possibly understand but God. But those are the times where we just push through those emotions and we say, in spite of it, I'm still going to declare that you are good. And I believe that as you consistently make that choice and that decision, that eventually you will find that God will come near to you. You will feel his presence. But even if he doesn't, that is still when we remind ourselves, it's not how I feel that moves me because feelings change and God never changes. His faithfulness never changes. The truth is this may be happening, but the fact is God is still on the throne and he knows what's going on. So my feelings 
Sometimes we just got to say, shut up feelings and worship God anyway. Mm-hmm. And, and I believe that if you make that a habit, you make that something in your life, it becomes something you begin to learn to press through and, and he'll show up. Sometimes I've been in prayer, you know, years ago, I remember there was a season where I prayed a lot and I would pray a couple of hours and I didn't feel anything until about two hours later. Now, am I telling you to worship for two hours? No. But I am telling, now if you want to, go for it. I mean, it's great. But what I am saying is we do it sometimes, many times, out of a complete step of faith, reminding ourselves who God is and allowing the Holy Spirit to speak that truth to us, mm-hmm. that, that who God is, what, what he will never do is lie, and his promises are yes and amen. So no, it doesn't matter how we feel. Uh, what matters is uh, God's word is still true, and what matters is is that we stand in truth, believing no matter what our emotions are saying, that we are we're going to just like we sang this morning. I'm going to stand. I'm going to I'm going to speak my faith. I'm going to believe God's promises and tell my emotions to shut up. Amen. Yeah. Sometimes you just need to tell them who's boss, and yes. that's Jesus yes. in your life. Amen. You got that right. I'm going to combine three questions together, Pastor Dave, because we had three different people ask something very similar. Um, It goes like this. I'm a believer, spirit-filled, and I pray all the time, but I cannot control my thoughts or the fear. Help. And the second part of this is what qualifies me to be protected by the blood? I'm saved, but I battle. Am I really worthy for God to protect me during these times? Amen. Well... As the song we heard so much on the radio said, fear is a liar. Fear is a liar. It'll take your breath. It'll take you off your feet at times. There isn't a person alive that hadn't battled some kind of fear. Runaway thoughts are not of God. Thoughts are something that we need to train our minds. You know, I have had different seasons in my life with runaway thoughts. I've had different seasons in my life where fear just seemed to just take a hold and a grip. And it was literally almost every waking moment and then even terror in the sleep time that I fought. I've had nights where I couldn't sleep. And I just kept hearing my pastor's voice saying, runaway thoughts are not of God. Runaway thoughts are not of God. So then we have to go back to God's answer for the problem because the problem is real. The problem is there. Yeah, all of us are facing things. But here's the key. The Bible says, taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ, casting down vain imaginations. Every thought, and I like the way the the New King James says it or the King James says Every thought that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Well, here's the thing. You have to renew your mind to the word. And a lot of believers, folks, listen. We say we read our Bibles. We say that. Oh, yeah, I read my Bible. But do you really? Do you really daily renew your mind The scripture says by the washing and the water of the word. Because here's what happens a lot of times. As we as young believers, if we get radically saved, we delve into the word. And a lot of times we bury ourselves in the word. But then as we've read it and it becomes familiar, we have a tendency to not daily wash in the word. We have a tendency, you know... (laughs) There's, you know, one thing I've noticed here lately in the last couple years is people have stopped wearing cologne. And part of the reason was because of the social stuff that you're causing my allergies to react, you know, different things. And and it's funny how political correctness even hit perfume or cologne. But cologne used to be a good way to just get the stink off if you hadn't had time to take a shower. Well, a lot of times we just quote a scripture to get the fear out if we haven't buried ourselves in the word. Don't use the Bible as a cologne. Use the Bible to take a shower every day. Let the Bible be your hot tub. Let the Bible be where you soak your mind because you may think this is just an exercise, and it is. But listen, if we don't exercise, we become 
fat and bone and skin. Muscle deteriorates if there's not resistance and if there's not discipline. And in the same way, our brain is kind of like a muscle and it has to have conditioning. You got to take your body to the gym. You know, yesterday I was at the house and wasn't a whole lot going on and I thought, man, I'm just going to take it easy today. But in my mind, I said, no, go up there and get on your total gym because if not, you're going to regret it when your belt has to go out another notch and you start saying, man, my shirt, Kyung, did you wash my shirt and it shrunk again? Everything's, so I made myself go get on that total gym and I made myself work out even though I didn't want to. The word of God is like that. It, it, I don't care how long you've been a Christian. I don't care how long you've been in church. You need a bath every day in the word. And you can take these beautiful promises, and especially with all these tools we have. Man, I used to have books stacked everywhere, and I would spend all my time. Now I just click a button. For example, man, I'm fighting fear. Well, what fear are you fighting today? Well, I'm fighting fear of this. You can just pull up on Google and say, scriptures about fighting fear. And you have got the greatest scholars in the world who will cut you know, compartmentalize or they'll bring all that stuff together and help you with a very concise study on what you're dealing with. You know, I'm a fear, I'm afraid that I won't have money to pay my bills. Okay, type in fear about prosperity, fear about not having enough. And guess what? Every scripture about God will take care of you. God will provide for you. He is Jehovah Jireh, our provider. He is El Shaddai. He is the big-breasted one. We'll never run out of milk with our God. He is the one who will always take care of us. And so as we wash our mind in the word, we become conditioned. The Bible, and I'll give you this one little thing that I learned years ago as a young man. You can't, rep you can't stop a thought. Once a thought runs away, you can't stop it. You have to replace it. Because your mind is going to be working all the time. All of us think all the time. It's just, what are you thinking about? Well, I used to try to stop thoughts. And then I, I developed this little technique. And it sounds so silly, but it worked every time. And the way I developed it was I was watching uh, a uh, motivational thing one day, and the guy was talking about how we have to become positive thinkers. And then he, he gave the illustration, and you probably, if you're old enough, you'll remember this technique being used. He'll say, okay, I want everyone in this room, I want you to think of a red pig riding a white horse with red eyes. Now, get that image in your mind. And everybody said, okay. And he said, now close your eyes. I want you to see that red pig with that white horse with red eyes. See it? See it? Now stop thinking about it. And everybody would be like, he said, now you're thinking about it, aren't you? You're still seeing the pig, aren't you? He'd say, now think of this picture. Well, what I started doing with my fear, whenever I would get those overwhelming thoughts I would just picture Jesus on the cross, the nails in his hands, the nails in his feet, the crown of thorns on his head, and I would just begin to praise him that he died for me and that no matter what I'm going through, his yes. death has paid the price for everything. Yes. And I would put that in to replace the other thought, and guess what? It worked. Yes. And I would have to do this sometimes continually. You know, when I first tried to quit smoking cigarettes... It's one of the most difficult things I ever did in my whole life was to quit smoking. And I remember I was trying to quit, and I had smoked for, uh, I think, like 14 years. And when you don't realize it when you smoke, and some of you that are still smoking don't understand exactly what I'm saying. Your whole life is programmed around a cigarette. Your work schedule, your eating habits, when you eat, where you eat, what you eat. For example, when I quit smoking I quit drinking coffee because coffee tasted so different. <laughs> As my taste buds began to come alive, everything smelled different. But when I quit smoking, I remember the Lord, again, gave me this little technique. And this is what he said. He said, every time you have a thought, I want a cigarette, 
just start saying, Jesus, help me. Jesus, and say it out loud. And don't stop saying it until the urge passes. Well, I got to tell you, the first couple days, it was like on a loop. Jesus, help me. 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 And I'd get through literally one minute at a time. Well, then I found out after a couple of days, instead of saying it every minute on the minute or every second on the second, it was every five minutes. And then it became every 10 minutes and then every 15 minutes and then every 20 minutes. And progressively, I kept overcoming and overcoming and overcoming. And I had another issue where I was afraid of witnessing. I was afraid of telling people about my faith because my greatest fear is a sanguine personality is rejection. And the Lord told me this. He said, if you bring my name out in any conversation, I'll protect you. And so I began doing that in conversation. I would just say the name of Jesus in a witnessing manner. Like, hey, do you know Jesus? Have, have, uh, which, what do you think thoughts about? And the minute I would say the word Jesus, it was like this peace would come over me and the rejection would go. The fear of rejection would go. And so that's a couple of techniques that I've used in, over the years to fight fear. Anybody else want to chime in on that? I know we've all battled it. We've all had issues with it. You know, Pastor Dave, you have a saying you taught us, which is, you know, you can't control a bird from flying over your head, but you can keep it from making the nest in your hair. I got that from Kenneth Hagin. I don't Hagen. have that problem. <laughs> right. right. Yeah. Yeah. You, yeah. Daddy Hagin. Yeah. It, but, you know, I think a lot of times when, we, uh, when we're battling different things, a lot of times we have to go back to, you know, the old computer term from the 70s and 80s, garbage in, garbage out. What have you been submitting your mind to? What have you been watching? You know, there was a big trend for a while where people love to watch horror movies. Mm -hmm. You know, they'd like to watch sci-fi movies and, and just to have that good scare. But you know what? There's literally a spirit that can enter inside of you. We yeah. call it a spirit of fear through what you hear, what you see. So we have to submit all of our senses, everything, to godly things because it is very hard to sit down and watch two, three, four hours to binge horror movies and then lay down and go to bed and not be freaked out when it gets dark. Well, it's the same thing with anything else. We have to make sure that we surround ourselves and we submit ourselves not to a spirit of fear, but work in the opposite spirit, be in a holy place where faith can activate. Because I know for myself, Fear, anger, and lust were three big things that I had to overcome when I got saved. And I had to remove myself from those areas where they were around and just stay far, far away so God could clean me up and just remove a lot of those things that have connected to me. Amen. Amen. Do you have any other questions? Let's do one more. Let's do one more. And this is actually a good one. This has pastors Greg and Tanya name all over it. This guy, I love him, man. He's pretty straightforward. He says, I've screwed up. He says, I love Jesus, but he said, I have two teenagers, and I have not been the type of father or example they should have. I'm wondering, is it too late for me to be a good dad or a good Christian in my home? Well, the new day begins today. Um, <clears throat> there's no time like the present to get things right. And so if the, if the Holy Spirit has convicted your heart on how you've been a father to your children, today's the start of correcting that. And I would say um, <clears throat> one of the most difficult things to do as a father, as a man, is to go to your own children or to your wife and ask uh, their forgiveness on, on how you've behaved, on how you've spoke to them, or how you've not done certain things. But I would go to your uh, children and I'd ask for their forgiveness. I'd go to your heavenly father and, and ask his forgiveness and begin to make a commitment to them, make a promise to them and, and to your father, your holy father, that from this day forward, I'm going to present myself as a man of God and what a godly father should be, whether your kids are still juveniles or whether they are adults, it, it does not matter. You're going to be their father forever. And so you make a commitment to them and to the Lord that from this day forward, what's been in the past, forgive me, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to step up to what I'm supposed to be to you. Amen. You want to add anything on that, Tanya? I just want to encourage you that it's never too late. Um, you have the ability to demonstrate for your children 
how God can transform someone. And um, I think that's a more powerful witness than anything you could ever say. And when you allow the Lord to reset you, your children are going to see the difference. And that will speak more volumes to them than anything else. There may be some fruit pop up from past years. But because you are a new creation, God will give you new creative ways to deal with that. Um, so I really don't think it's too late. It's never too late. Um, just, just be humble before them. Um, because as they see the Lord work in you, um, they will desire for that to, to happen in them also. Amen. You know, I think that is so true. I, I know with my own children, adolescence is one of the most difficult times of parenting. A lot of times we watch our kids every second while they're little, little guys and toddlers. You know, we're so afraid they're going to stick their something in a light uh, or an electrical socket or they're going to do so, drink something poison out of the, the kitchen sink. But a lot of times as teenagers, we lighten the strings and I'll just say the same danger for them spiritually becoming, drinking something deadly or poisonous. A teenager has that on this thing right here. Any parent that allows a teenager to take a phone or anything connected to the internet into their bedroom at night is setting themselves up for a disaster. Uh, when my children were younger, I had one computer in the house and while they were teens, I, I, I kept the computer in the living room. I actually put a computer desk in the living room and I said, no one will be on a computer except right here. And if I ever walk in a room and I see you click a button and that screen goes off, that tells me you've been somewhere you shouldn't have. Your computer privileges are over. And so I had to set boundaries. And of course, that was before you know, the phone technology we have now. But I know a lot of parents, including my own children and my grandchildren now, you know, at a certain time every day, the Internet is shut off in their house. And uh, their, their kids can't get online. And their phones, you know, I know parents that say, okay, it's bedtime, bring your phone in here and put it in the drawer beside me and your dad's bed. And you're not going on your phone after we go to bed tonight. Because, again, re realize that Satan is a troll who is waiting to infect your young people with wrong philosophies, with unclean things. He's a troll, and he is in that device working at all times, getting pop-ups. And, and, you know, I, I hear it all the time. Well, I don't understand why, you know, porn's popping up on my computer. Well, you ask any IT guy, it's because someone went there. I mean, I've, I've been, I've not, I haven't had a porn site pop up ever on one of my devices, ever, except for one time at home, and we had a young lady spend the night with my daughters, and when that thing popped up on my wife and she about blew a gasket, I told my girls, I said, your friend was on my computer, and said, no, dad, no, and I said, yes, and so we had to reformat that whole computer to get rid of those cookies or whatever they call them, how they get traced back to you. But I'm telling you, man, this thing is real, and, and you need to guard your home and guard every gateway into your child's lives. And you can do that while they're still in your home and teach them to do it. And it's a beautiful thing when I walk in and I see one of my grandkids and they don't even know I'm there or watching and something, it will even come on a cartoon like some kind of witchcraft or something and they'll change the channel and then I'll hear one of them say to the other one, we're not allowed to watch that. That's what we need to build into our children is if you give that unclean a gateway into your heart, that spirit will get inside you and then that desire will begin to grow out of control and will amplify. So it's very important that we do that and we, we keep that. Go ahead. I just want to add to that. Um, all of us are going through uncertain times right now. Um, how we carry that in our homes is, is impacting our children. So along with what he just said, if you are panicking and operating in a spirit of fear, even if you're not saying it in front of them, your children know. And you are opening the door for that fear to be in your home. 
So I encourage you to set the example. I don't care how young your children are. They are very in tune to the spiritual atmosphere in your home. This is the time to build yourself up. Um, I listened to Benny Hinn earlier, and um, he said when we are in a time of prayer, that we are hiding in him. And when we choose not to pray, we are hiding from him. Mm -hmm. And typically the reason we hide from him is a sin issue. And whether we like it or not, when you read the scripture about, um, you know, there are wars and rumors of wars, he doesn't recommend you don't be afraid. It's a command. Don't be afraid. So when you allow fear to overtake you, you're stepping out of his will. And so I encourage you, stay prayed up because your little ones need you to be strong in this time of uncertainty. And you will build faith warriors who can be a light even to other friends when you, when you build that foundation in. So just like he said, whatever gate you open in your heart, you are opening them to your children. So be wise during this time. When you are feeling weak, you know, like Nicole said, praise, get in your word, pray, do whatever you need, reach out to another believer. You know, we, we have taken for granted the time where we gather together and we see each other here. Use this time to reach out to one another on a one-on-one -on -one basis. If you know a single mom out there, reach out and say, how's it going? Do you need anything? This is the time for the church to step up and say, we're here for each other. And you never know that one phone call may give someone the courage and the hope to overcome that fear for that day. So be the church in your home and out of your home because it's necessary during this time. Amen. Well, I just want to take a minute here, and I know it's a little more difficult to give long attention time when you're home and distractions are going on and kids are running around and dogs are barking, but while we still have your attention, I just want to ask you, how are things with the Lord? Is Jesus your Lord and Savior? Because that's the most important thing right now. It doesn't matter what happens in this planet. The important thing is, what will happen to you? when you die. Death is all around us right now. Death is being broadcast 24-7. I'm, I'm limiting myself now to just a few minutes of news a day because I have to stay rooted and grounded in the word and I don't want to be given over to the hysteria that's going on and I don't want to be out hoarding toilet paper. I want to be walking in faith believing and I just encourage every person here where is your heart right now with God? This is a good time to take inventory. This is a good time to just repent of your sins. This is a time to reinforce Jesus. You are my Savior and you are my Lord and you got my back. This is a time to make sure that your policy is in force. Sometimes policies in our normal insurance lapse. And we have to renew our policy pretty much every year. It's time to just go in and get a renewal and a time of refreshing from God. It's time to say, you know what? Things aren't just going to be just like they always are. Just like Peter said, they've been saying for years, where's the promise of his coming? All things remain the same. Well, guess what? All things are not the same now. Things have changed. I'm going to pray a prayer with you right now, and I'm going to believe God with you. I want to pray over your home, and I want to pray into your home. And I do command the spirit of fear to leave every home that this broadcast is coming into. To leave every car that this broadcast is coming into. No matter where you are, every office, I command the spirit of fear to go from you now in the name of Jesus. And I do speak the peace of God over you. And I do bind the spirit that blinds this world. Lest the glorious light of the gospel shine in. I bind that blinding spirit that would try to stop anyone from receiving Christ as Savior. And I command that spirit to loose them. I command those scales of darkness to fall from their eyes. I pray the Holy Spirit would just surge over you right now where you are. That your life will be forever changed. 
by the power of God. God will visit you wherever you are right now. Wherever you're listening to this, God will visit you right now. And if you need to make some things right with God, if you need to receive Jesus as your Lord, or if you need to repent of some sin that you know your heart's not right with God, no one knows but maybe you and God, but you know it's time to do that. And I'm just going to ask you to repeat this prayer with me. There's many ways you can cry out to God. We're just trying to make it as simple as possible. Some people would say, well, Dave, I don't even know how to pray like I should. Well, I understand that. That's why we're here to help you. That's why we're here to offer guidance to you today. And we're here to confirm you in your faith and tell you it's going to be all right. God's on the throne. Prayer changes things in people. Pray this with me. Father, in Jesus' name, I ask you now to come into my heart. I know Jesus is Lord. I know he is my Savior. I welcome him as my King. Jesus, forgive my sins. I confess all sin. Every sin I've ever committed, I confess it. I can't save myself. I know you can save me. And I thank you for your salvation now. Lord, I need your strength and I need your courage. I want to walk upright in a fallen world. I want to be light. I don't want to be darkness. And I ask the light of Christ shine in me. Holy Spirit, I ask you to fill me, baptize me with strength and love. Change me from the inside out. Fill me with the power of God. And I welcome you into my life now. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. You know, if you've just prayed that prayer, you're confirmed in your faith. Your sins are forgiven. The Bible says, the Son of Man on earth has power to forgive sin. And then Jesus actually told his disciples that they or we have power to forgive sin. And I tell you in the name of Jesus today, if you prayed that prayer and you were sincere in your heart, you're forgiven. Are you perfect? Yes, in your spirit, but not in your soul and body. But God wants to help you overcome and come through every bit of this. And you're going to come through as a champion in Jesus. Amen. As we close this morning, we're going to share a song with you. We want to just have this last time of worship together. Thank you so much for tuning in. We'll be back here Wednesday night at 7 for another broadcast. And we'll be probably be doing some things through the week. We might do a couple of lunch hour prayer segments where we do a live broadcast just to pray together for a little bit of time through the day. We love you and bless you. Stay connected. Stay tuned in so you can see what's going on next. And again, thank you for taking the time to be with us this morning.
you're never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let me down. Thank you for tuning in today, and uh, just just so you know, church offices, we will have a minimal staff here this week, man in the office as we need to. As far as I know, at this time, our child care and learning center are open because the state has asked us as an essential service to stay open at this time. If that changes by directive of the governor, we'll let you know on that, but as for right now, we will have office staff here and our child care center will be open for the parents that have to work now. And again, thank you for being a blessing. We love you. And if I don't see you before, we'll be back here from time to time and online Wednesday night.